it is a stark landscape straight out of history. A frosty vision of the Old West that spreads out beneath the big Montana sky. Herds of livestock roam here under the watchful eye of cowboys and wranglers. But these are not ordinary ranch hands. And this is no ordinary ranch. Our count today is probably 1279, and the range of crimes uh, is everything from capital cases. Uh, we have people on death row, if you will, all the way down to uh, property crimes or drug crimes. I was convicted of deliberate homicide and aggravated kidnapping. Fourth DUI felony. Got 13 months, four years probation. State prison, Deer Lodge, Montana. Some people are doing it. There you go. My charge is criminal possession of dangerous drugs. I got five years. It is a remote outpost where the stunning natural beauty is broken only by electric fences topped with razor wire. We got a fence alarm on zone 26. Fence alarm zone 25. Power one, zone 25 is clear. 10-4. And I'll secure it. We're one of the few systems in the country that have, as a perimeter security system, electronics in our fence. If there's people in an area or zone that they shouldn't be, that's detected and it's reported. In its present day setting, Montana State Prison operates efficiently as both a ranch and a modern high security fortress. But its legacy is dark. It is a history marked by violent uprisings, inhumane conditions, and brutality. That legacy began five miles away from the current cell blocks in the state's original stone prison, now a relic and tourist attraction. Life in those cells were cold because the windows facing the streets were broken out. You had pigeons flying up and down the hallway. You had screaming, yelling, noise all over the place. And every now and then you'd see uh, toilet paper firebombs coming out. You'd hear people screaming all the time. You'd hear, help, help. It was opened in 1871 by the federal government as a territorial prison. The tiny penitentiary contained a cell house for 14 inmates and little else. Its purpose was simple, swift and terrible retribution for the thieves, murderers, and con artists who had flocked here, seeking fast money and unlimited wealth in the territory's mining towns. In 1889, President Grover Cleveland signed the omnibus bill which paved the way for Montana to become the 41st state. Along with statehood came the responsibility for running the prison. By this time, its population had increased sevenfold, and the number of lawless men in the state was on the rise. To keep pace, the prison required expansion. The cash-strapped state needed a warden who could serve as both lawman and general contractor. The choice was an obscure prison guard named Frank Conley. His impact on the physical structure can still be seen today. One of the things uh, that Warden Conley did during his tenure uh, was to build this 1912 cell house. And at the time, it was one of the most modern cell houses in the entire United States. And one of the most important things about it was that it uh, had modern indoor plumbing. And even though it didn't have hot water, it had just cold water, it was one of the few cell houses in the country at that time that had these type of accessories. Warden Conley's guard staff was afforded another innovation by the cell house, a feature that was unseen by the convicts. We're located in the uh, tunnels right now. We're walking toward the uh, main tunnel, which is uh, used for security. In the old prison, basically what the guards would do would come down here and station themselves at various gun ports. This uh, tunnel, which is located about ten and a half feet below the Tower 7, they could actually go into uh, the cell house from this area. 
What we're going to do is we're going to go down and look at a uh, gun port which looked into the original dining room of the facility. The officer would come through here at meal times and then this door would be opened and he would station himself here to keep an eye on uh, what might be going on in the dining area. If there was a problem, he had a 30-30 rifle that he carried that he would use, or he would have a uh, tear gas canister that he could toss into the room. The serrated edges along the top of the gun port were so that if an inmate were to grab the rifle, he couldn't pull it all the way through. The gun would come up and catch on the serrated edge of the uh, gun port. The tunnels allowed guards to keep a vigilant eye on every aspect of the prisoners' lives. This is the one-inch steel access door that would take you into the shower area. Whenever the men were showering in this area and so forth, there was a guard stationed up in this area. The 1912 cell house was the culmination of an ambitious building project that used inmates as unpaid laborers. It had begun in 1893 with the building of a stone wall to replace the wooden fence that enclosed the original prison complex. Made of sandstone quarried at the site, the wall rises 24 feet high. Its guard towers and main entrance give the impression that they surround a castle. But the stone buildings inside the wall offered a variety of grim chambers and holding cells that were used to control the prison's troublemakers. Among the worst was a group of cells that offered complete isolation. They were nicknamed Siberia. This is a total isolation cell. The prisoners that were placed in here had very little. They had no clothes, they had no toilet facilities. Go on in. It's difficult to believe that this cold, dark room could bring about the desired change in a convict's behavior. But it was just one of the harsh punishments awaiting those sentenced to hard time inside Montana State Prison. By the turn of the 20th century, 400 people were locked inside the Montana State Penitentiary. Men like Charles Franklin, who arrived in 1914, sentenced to one year for stealing a cow. And George Culver, convicted of shooting another man's horse. Julian Williams had been sent here for grand larceny. He stole 42 yards of cloth and two silk vests. Legend holds that inmates caught trying to escape were forced to wear cement-soled shoes to deter further attempts. But the shoes, found when the prison was abandoned, may have had another purpose. The more plausible story that goes along with these shoes is the fact that the uh, prison operated a brickyard. And when the men would go into the kiln before it was completely cooled, that this actually acted as an insulating barrier between the hot floor of the kiln and the, and the bricks and what have you, and keep their feet from being burnt and what have you. The most dangerous offenders were housed in the prison's maximum security wing. Men like Joseph Moat, who was serving 25 years for rape, and Thomas Gould, who had a life sentence for killing his wife. Inmates like these had little to lose. Assaults on the guard staff were common, as were the penalties that followed. This is one of the disciplinary cells for the maximum security unit. This cell would be used for the worst of the worst. The inmate would be brought in here, usually stripped naked, and would be handcuffed to this, which was called the slide bar. Uh, they had the option of either standing up or sitting down or possibly lying down. Uh, they were usually only given uh, bread and water in this cell and that uh, every third day they would probably be given a meal and they would be asked 
if they had modified their behavior at that point. If not, they would be given another three days in this disciplinary cell. In Montana, such punishments were not solely relegated to the distant past of another century. James Blodgett was the prison's deputy warden when the original prison was closed in 1982. Now, this is the dungeon, uh, this or the hole as it was termed, and uh, this was our primary means of discipline in the institution all the way up through the 1970s. This was the most interesting area and probably the one that the inmates hated to be in the, the most. Uh, we called it the cooler. And it actually was a vegetable cooler that was connected to the old uh, kitchen next door here. And essentially what would happen is, when we brought an inmate down here, uh, we had a little talk with him right out in front of the door here. And said, uh, you know, you, you know why you're down here? You know what, what the reason is? You swore at officer, you struck at an officer, you're assaultive. You're going to go in the hole here, and these are the conditions. You're going to stay here until you decide that that ain't going to happen again. The cooler. The slide bar, Siberia, harsh treatments meant to maintain control and discipline. But all too often, the inmates retaliated with rebellion, escape attempts, and murder. One of the prison's most brutal uprisings took place in 1908. The warden commonly held a morning court every morning, and inmates would come up there. Well, this particular morning in 1908, uh, four inmates planned an escape. The instigators were led by George Rock, a convicted murderer, and William Hayes, a horse thief. They had uh, secreted a knife, and when they got up to the office, um, they pulled a knife and stabbed Warden Conley. The interesting thing about that is the Warden Conley always carried a 41 caliber sawed-off pistol in his pocket all the time. And when uh, Rock and Hayes came in, uh, he pulled his pistol and he shot Hayes right behind the ear. Before it was over, inmate George Rock stabbed Deputy Warden John Robinson to death. And William Hayes, despite being shot in the head, managed to slit Warden Conley's throat. Conley survived, but his wound required more than 100 stitches. For their barbarous acts, the two men were hanged in the prison yard. And they were the only two inmates that were hanged in this yard because uh, hanging in Montana was uh, the job of the counties. But Conley wanted to make sure that those two inmates hanged in this yard so that the inmates could tell, could see what would happen if they uh, acted out like that again. After that time, executions in Montana were carried out on a contraption called the Galloping Gallows. The Galloping Gallows was originally built in 1920 in Forsyth, Montana. It was used for the execution of eight men in Montana from the date of till about 1939. Uh, the gallows uh, was called the Galloping Gallows because it was broken down and taken to the county seat where the execution was held. By the late 1950s, Montana State Prison was deteriorating. Its oldest standing cell house had been built in 1896, and the building known as the new cell house dated back to 1912. Cells with toilet buckets in it, uh, instead of running water, the conditions were atrocious for not only inmates, but also for staff. The staff on the towers also had buckets and uh, no running water. And as a result of that, the inmates, uh, as they did in many prisons in the United States during the 50s, uh, we're fed up with it. The warden at that time labeled it a tension-ridden, disorganized mess and a powder keg set to explode. Newspapers called it a smoking volcano. That volcano erupted in a prison riot on April 16, 1959. The ringleaders were inmate Jerry Miles, a convicted robber with a five-year sentence, and Lee Smart Jr., just 19, who had clubbed a traveling salesman to death. They were on this, this third galley up here. There was a guard on this catwalk who was opening a window, 
and he was he was trying to let some fresh air in and uh, the ringleader threw a, a broom across that was on fire or first they threw gasoline on him and soaked him with gas when he tried to run this way they threw another lighted object on the other side of him so he was trapped and he couldn't see his eyes were covered with gasoline and he was really scared what they wanted was a 30-30 rifle that he had which was locked in the far gun cage down there in a cabinet they got his keys they got the rifle the two inmates concealed the rifle and proceeded to the deputy warden's office Jerry Miles the ringleader it was uh, Lee Smart, his 19-year-old uh, fellow ringleader, came up here with a rifle into this vestibule, and there were guards in here protecting the deputy warden. They were waiting for the guard to open the door to let another guard out, and when he did, they came right in and took two guards hostage and pushed them into a bathroom here. They came directly into the deputy warden's office and the deputy warden was at his desk. His name was Ted Rothy. They came in here. Jerry Miles had a knife, lunged across the desk at Ted Rothy. And tr he, he tried to get him. He was a big man. Lee Smart had the rifle. He shot in here and hit Ted Rothy and killed him instantly. He fell down behind the floor there, and the deputy warden had died within the first hour of the riot. Inmates in the 1912 cell house joined the disturbance and rampaged, armed with homemade knives and stolen meat cleavers. The ringleaders took three guards captive and moved to the cell house tower. Miles and Smart then threatened to burn their hostages alive if they were not granted freedom. The standoff continued for 36 hours before Montana's governor called in the big guns. The National Guard stormed in here there was a highway patrolman on the prison wall seen through the windows here. And he fired rounds through this window toward the door in the tower where the ringleaders were hidden to keep them from charging out and setting the hostages on fire. Finally, National Guardsmen aimed a World War II bazooka at the tower. This is an example of the bazooka that was used by the National Guard during the 1959 riot. Uh, two rounds were actually fired from it, from the west wall to the tower where the inmates were uh, held up at the time. Uh, one round went high and one round went into the area exactly to the window where the inmates were. Trapped in the tower and under bazooka fire, Lee Smart murdered his partner, Jerry Miles, with their stolen prison rifle. Then he turned the gun on himself. The riot had ended in a bloodbath, but it would be the last serious uprising at the old Montana State Prison. The state's attorney general insisted that trying to keep 20th century hoodlums in a 19th century jail was impossible. And so, Montana built a new prison, one they hoped would be riot-proof. Safety, control, maximum security. Years of neglect, crowding, and riots had eroded these factors away at the old Montana State Prison. Reasserting those fundamentals was the objective when prison officials opened a new prison in 1977. Well, basically, as you look at that physical plant and this physical plant, you'll see, again, the modernization. Uh, there are basically two types of security systems and corrections. They're dynamic and static security systems. And when you look, you know, the modernization, we have a better opportunity to direct supervision of the inmate population on the cell block versus, you know, the old system didn't lend itself to that. So it's a little bit better security system for starters. And in, you know, economy of scale, it's just a much larger institution. We basically outgrew the facility downtown. The scale is indeed gigantic. The double perimeter fence encloses 60 acres. The cell houses, or custody units, are watched 24 hours a day from five security towers. 
Powers Perimeter, Cold Street has two inmates up to the outside yard. It's better than the old joint because of the physical plant, you know, the nicer rooms and everything we have available to us, but it's still a prison. I mean, it's still got the, the games and the problems and the anger. Richard Stewart is 24 years in on a 100-year sentence for murder. All the stuff that I paint kind of messes with people's minds when I tell them I've never seen an elk or a deer or nothing alive. Although the prison is surrounded by Montana's mountains, wildlife, and ranch land, few inmates ever see it. In winter, the view from their cell windows more resembles an outpost in Antarctica. Yeah. Ace of diamonds. No, I have an education, matter of fact. For new inmates, the introduction to prison life begins with a stay in the reception center. It'll be one of the only times my wife gets to see me. She'll come and visit. She'll come and visit. But for right now. A lot of these guys, whenever they first get here, they've just been sentenced sometimes that, that morning before they arrive here and a guy just gets sentenced and he uh, realizes he's going to spend the next 40, 50, 100 years behind bars. Uh, they can be overwhelmed by that and they are rather docile and easily manipulated. Like the old prison, the reception center is also filled beyond capacity. <laughs> We're being overwhelmed by the, the guys coming into the facility right now. I guess would be the way to put it. And uh, a lot of these cells were originally designed for one individual, and we've got as many as three of them, three individuals in a lot of these cells. Yeah, with, with three people, you know, one guy on the floor, you know, yeah, it is pretty crowded. But, you know, it's just the way the system is. Been here a month now, but I just done, got done doing eight and counting. And the trial system is going pretty slow right now. Kenneth Van Morsel is here on a felony drunk driving conviction, his fourth. He is also the cell block's unofficial card dealer. Do a lot of reading, do a lot of thinking, <laughs> writing, you know, doing stuff like that. Here you go, Coyote. My name's uh, Mervyn Little Coyote. I'm a Northern Cheyenne Indian. My charge is criminal possession of dangerous drugs. I was scared, I mean, that was my first time being in trouble and first time I've been in jail. I got five years with one year credit, so I have about two years left, a little over two years left to go. Hang on, we're not set yet. They got it. Huh? That little joker he used? I got three spades. Oh, I got Jack of Heart. Are you oh, sure? That's Jack of Heart. Oh, man. Who's this? Who's this Heart. last one? Heart. The guys in here are fairly happy-go-lucky. They uh, uh, seem to enjoy it, the fact that they're back here. Some of them seem to be having fun that they're in here for the first time. Maybe it's uh, that they think they're being tough or, you know, they're, they're convicts now. I don't know if that's something to be proud of in today's world, but uh, some of them think it is. Big guy. Uh, queen. For these prisoners, the immediate concern is not to get out of Montana State Prison. This is the beginning of their stay. It is simply to be processed out of here and into a job, a quieter cell, and the monotony of a permanent routine inside a maximum security prison. Of a, a hard reality to come to. 
For most inmates at Montana State Prison, the reality is work. All but the newest inmates and the most troublesome spend their days at a job. I do everything. I fold anything on this table most of the time. And if I'm not busy over here, I, I go over to the sheet machine, or I go over there and help Moses, or I go over to the towel machine. I, I usually try to stay busy. Modern penal philosophy holds that offenders are easier to manage if they are kept occupied instead of idle. But as they work, there's plenty of time to think about what brought them here. So I was intoxicated, this, the individual messed with my wife at the time, so I took it from there. I was upset, he threatened to kill me, so it was more of a self-defense thing, but I, like I said, I could have gotten away with just endangering the guy, but instead I didn't. I just ran him over a couple times, so, and that was, <laughs> it was wrong, it was wrong. Most of Montana State Prison's convict population lives and works behind the 16-foot fences that enclose the 60-acre compound. But for a few trusted inmates who do not pose an escape risk, the prison extends beyond those boundaries. Checking these mineral tubs, make sure they got mineral and uh, make sure the water system's working all right. And, uh, just looking for foot rot, pneumonia, anything like any kind of sickness, bad eyes. These are all yearling heifers that are going to be bred in the next month or two. This is the Montana of the imagination a vision rarely associated with a maximum security prison. The prison's livestock range employs 32 inmates who care for and feed a herd of 3,000 cattle on an expansive 40,000 acre ranch that adjoins the prison compound. Jim Smith is serving two years for drunk driving. Well, if you're doing time, this is probably the best place to be. I mean, you're out, you're active all the time and you get chances to learn things and uh, you know you can better yourself out here. The prison also maintains an additional 330 cows in its dairy herd. Inmates work 24 hours a day to keep up with an endless parade in the milking lines. Oh yeah we got milk. Mike Fishburne's good prison record earned him his job here. I've been in Montana State Prison for uh, about two years now, just shy of two years. I've got about three months left to go and then I'm uh, actually on my way back home, which is back to Billings, Montana. I got convicted of uh, criminal production of a dangerous drug. I was growing marijuana is what I was doing, being a roommate work. And uh, we had some guys that uh, we were actually selling some weed to out of the uh, house and they ended up coming down and turned us into the uh, FBI or whatever and we ended up getting arrested and that's how I ended up here. I got a five-year term out of it. Yeah. Yeah. And see, they kind of just stand here and they're a little bit stubborn once in a while. Just got to give them a little pass. They do come in a little dirty. We come up, we dip on the actual pin itself, and we come down the line and we hit the other one. And we go ahead and we just place the milkers on the actual pin. The prison homogenizes milk that is supplied to schools and state hospitals. The surplus is sold on the open market. What are you doing this afternoon? Uh huh. Yes, I sure can. Thank you, ma'am, for your time. You have a good afternoon. Thank you very much. Inside the High Security Industries building, prisoners are at work in a less traditional okay, vocation. 
the computers are in there do all the dialing. So we're just sitting and listening until someone answers the phone, and then when they answer the phone, we'll, we'll greet them and uh, explain to them what we are representing and what we're doing. Many of these men are convicted murderers, but in here, they are telemarketers. Good afternoon, sir. This is Jim Murray, and I'm calling on the behalf of... They read from a prepared script and today are selling tickets to a charity benefit. Hello. How have I done? I've done 32 sales today, which is a pretty good day for me. Some days you have bad days where you might only have three sales. They go up and down. Right now, we're selling in California. Basically, I'm calling because... Rick Warden has been here for 21 years. Murdered some people. Got drunk. Bad night out. I'll call back later, sir. And this here is just a job. The prison is all this is. It's just a prison job. Can we count on your support this year and send you some tickets? You have a good day, man. Bye-bye. This is the highest paid job in the prison. The money they make buys them canteen. They get candy bars, um, popcorn, anything that's on canteen, you know, they can purchase. The inmates also contribute money to the prison to offset the cost of their incarceration. Although controversial, the supervisors of the program believe their control measures keep the phone calls safe. These guys are not allowed to take down any customer information, and if they do, they are terminated and written up. Disciplinary action will follow. They just ask the person how many tickets they would like, and then they say, great, we'll hand the phone over my, so my supervisor can verify the sale. We take down their name, their mailing address, their phone number, and how many tickets they want. And the inmates never see that information, ever. This is Jim calling on the behalf of the We're putting money back into the system. We're paying room and board. And some people like that other idea. Some people, you're not going to make them happy one way or another. They'd like to see us throw it in a cell and never let out. It is curious to note that the people answering at home have no idea that the friendly voice on the line is actually a convicted felon. I think they would be shocked. The public doesn't want inmates calling them in their homes, um, talking to, you know, even their children answer the phone sometimes. We only talk to adults, but your kids still answered the phone. No, is your mom at home? Rick, and I'm calling on behalf of Or your dad? Okay, well, thank you for your time, and we'll just keep you on your uh, callback list, okay? Okay, bye-bye. How are you doing this afternoon? This is Jim. Is your mom or dad at home? Hello. Twenty-five years have passed since Montana State Prison opened its modern facility five miles away from the original and outmoded Stone Fortress. Today, the new prison operates smoothly for the most part, despite the challenges posed by a wide range of modern inmates, one-third of whom are sex offenders. About 80% are child molesters and about 20% are rapists. Then we have some sex offenders who are pedophiles, which means that their primary sexual interest is with children. Unlike many other institutions, Montana State Prison does not segregate its sex offenders from the general population. We have sex offenders in all the different units. We have them in A, B, C. Over here in close one and close two, they're all over the institution. You pass them wherever you go in the institution. The prison manages its diverse population with assistance from the latest technology. Inmates are routinely subjected to low-level x-ray scans that can detect weapons or contraband hidden in their clothing or their bodies. Inmates uncontrollable by any other means are removed from the cell blocks and confined to the prison's maximum security lockdown unit. Well, they're one-on-one -on -one escorts, or two-on-one two -on -one escorts, the way we handle everybody. They're all restrained behind their backs. We run them in. Uh, we shake them down when they come out. We run them in, place them in their house. Wait till they get to remove the cuffs. That guy assaulted an officer by throwing uh, his saliva on him. 
in a cup. And he has an infectious disease, so he has to wear, anytime we have any hands on with him, he has to be wearing a spit hood. Any inmate that spits on us or anything like that, they, we put that on for our protection. Hey, Sherman, lock down. Uh, we're going on D block. This is the max custody block. Uh, we have some of our death row inmates on here. And permanent max residents will be here for a year, several years. We're going to do you guys listen? Two more sets of building teams. We got uh, upper C8, upper B5 and 7. Yeah. Do we got two on the same block? Yeah, we got two on this block here. We'll grab them off of this block first, two off of this block. We're going to go on B. Which house is in there? Uh, these are the uh, most dangerous inmates we have in the institution is on this block. Max general population would be people that over a period of time have proven that they are not capable of, of getting along well in general population and are placed in that custody level for their protection, protection of staff and protection of the other members of the inmate population. In the MAX unit, movement is severely restricted. Contact with the outside world is limited to an hour a day in the day room and an hour in a caged recreation yard. Open lower D5. Anytime we pull an inmate out, put our hands up here so we don't make a mistake, open up the wrong door. This is pretty much their living quarters in maximum security. We got their little table, the mattress, pillow, and their toilet. The inmates here in Max spend about 20 hours a day in their cell. Every hour, Sergeant Stacklin or a member of his staff inspects the maximum security cells to make sure there have been no escapes, sudden illnesses, or suicides. We're on the block now, and I would, uh, you know, just physically look in there and see that he's there, and then I just sign off on it. Oh, my dear. You'll get it here in a second. And my lunch. You'll get that in a second, too. This guy right here is on death row. This guy's in here for uh, disciplinary reasons. This guy's here is on death row. This guy's here is on death row. This guy here is on death row. To deal with the most unruly and self-destructive inmates, the prison has a cell that serves as the last resort. This is uh, Max Isolation Cell 1. Another known as the rubber room. Yeah, it's completely enclosed the floor, the ceiling, the walls, the door is all rubber. Um, this right here is the toilet that they uh, use to use the restroom. Uh, when they're in here, they're totally, uh, all they have is their underwear and what we call space blankets. Not actually a space blanket, it's a canvas blanket type thing that they can't tear apart. The reason why this uh, cell is uh, rubber is because so self-injury, they can't self-hurt themselves because uh, it's totally rubber um, banging their head. Uh, they can't hurt themselves. The tight controls here would give the impression that the high security unit has always been immune to disruption and disturbance. It is a false impression. In September 1991, Nine high security inmates staged a carefully orchestrated riot. It began in the recreation yard. 
we had inmates coming out of the, the recreation yard, being escorted by officers. The, the, the fence in the recreation yard, which is in the middle of the unit, had been compromised. The inmates broke out of their recreation cage and overpowered their guards. Then they set fires with clothes and blankets and smashed the security glass of the main control booth. Five guards were taken hostage. It took four hours for the administration to coordinate its response. Then the prison's tactical unit stormed the cell block and quelled the uprising with tear gas. The hostages were released unharmed, but five inmates known to be snitches had been beaten to death by fellow inmates. Since that dark day, 10 years ago, the prison has operated without major incident. It is a sign that the improvements which have been made here are generally working. There are real efforts on the part of the prison staff to make doing time less painful than it has been historically. This is one of the best levels to live on. You got your mountains out there all around during the winter. And in the late fall, you can see the deer and the elk running down over on the mountains over here. This is my cube. You want to come into my house? This is my house, 248. This is where I call home, my house. In my view, the mountains out the back window. Good place to live, nice house. Not very big, but it's home. For all its improvements, Montana State Prison is still a prison. But in many ways, it is at least a humane experience. For both the inmates and staff, any improvement is a welcome change. Given the legacy of violence and brutality that was born down the road more than 100 years ago.